Well, we're back again. Episode four. You're listening to Low, the show. Sweet Five Production bringing to you live. And I'm telling you, we're so excited about what's going to happen today. It's going down to the Funk Sound, backed up by James Brown. I'm talking about y'all going to dance your feet today. I'm talking what they say, fast feet eat, slow feet sleep. Well, ain't nobody going to sleep today because this is going to be rocking and rolling today. And remember what I said, two ears, one mouth. Make sure you're listening because if you don't, you might just miss something. But hey, the motivation quote of the day. Tough road often lead to worthwhile destination. And like they say, champions don't get there easy. Every champion have a story. And boy, we got a story to tell today. But that road wasn't easy. We know it was tough because no one just become a champion. They always ask this question, is champion born or is champion made? Well, we're going to find out today, was it born or was he made today? Because I have someone special. Now, I know for me, I'm a champion in a lot of ways. I'm a champion in life. I'm a champion I wake up in the morning. Can I tell myself I am the greatest? Everything I do is all about being the best. Now, I want you to do the same. Championship in football, championship in track. Guess what? It didn't happen by, by just jumping on the field or, or running on the track. It didn't happen. There was a process in being a champion. There's a journey that had to be from A to Z. So you can't just go to Z. You got to start with A. A. That was all about today. You know what? The man that's here today is with me. The man from a little town, a little city. I'm not even going to tell you where the city is. Because you might say, wow, I never knew that. You never know where you find the little heroes at. You never know where you find the little boys from a little city that would grow up to be a successful man. They grow up to be a champion, right? On the field, off the field, in the classroom, on TV, live, everywhere they go. Well, I have the one that made it possible. The one that made it. The one that I know personally. I know that this young man here did some great things. But I don't want to tell the story. Cause every champion have a story. And that story is going to happen right now with Mr. Maurice Allen. <laughs> Maurice Allen. Now, I like, this ain't the one that I kind of like, I'm going to give you the bio, I'm going to break it down. I'm going to tell them everything about Maurice Allen, right? I'm just going to say two times, world champion. Now we at three time world champion. Three. Three time world champion. Yes, sir. Longest drive competition in golf. Yes, sir. Wow. That it, that didn't happen overnight. No. You no, didn't sir. become a three time world champion overnight. No, that sir. was a process. Before we find out that process, Maurice, tell us a little bit about Maurice. Who is Maurice Allen? Where you from, right? And how you get to where you at now? Just a little, just give him a little bit before we dive into it. All right, I'll give you two answers then. Okay. Uh, I am the prayers of the slaves that were beaten, raped, and murdered in the fields. Mm. And secondly, I'm just a kid from Pine Hills, Florida. P P Pine Hills, Florida. That's it. A little Pine Hills. Yeah. Little Pine Hills with a lot of talent. But they, but they, but they say like a lot of people can't come from little towns like that and and make it out and be successful and be a three-time champion in a sport that not even given to them, that a sport that not even for them, a, a, a sport they didn't even think of doing. How that happened? I mean, where oh, did man. that start from? Oh, man, following God's path. Mm. That's it. It's simple. It's not hard. Uh huh. It's easy. Okay. God's plan is greater than your vision. And if mm. you understand to submit to his plan, you never know what can happen. There's a lot of distractions and deterrence along the way, a lot of obstacles along the way, and everybody has them. It doesn't matter where you're from. You can be from Pine Hills. You can be from Windermere. You can be from Boca. You can be from Beverly Hills. It doesn't matter. Everybody has what they see as distractions and deterrence off of their plan, off of their vision, off of their purpose. But it's all about truly submitting to what God's plan is. Boy, I love that right there. And I just love how you make sure you, they, they know it. Nothing is possible without God. We already, we already know that. But here's what's interesting. Like, when you talk about God, right, we talk about a plan that you have. I'm going to go back to the plan that we had. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. A different plan that we had, huh? Different plan. A, a different coach-player relationship. Correct. But 
I think what people make a big mistake in when they're talking about playing with coach to player relationship, because that was the segment episode three that we talked about. Mm -hmm. And we talked about fathers involved and a lot of things involved. But that plan don't happen without somebody special that made sure that this coach and relationship and player relationship was gonna grow. That plan was mama. I think I think where people mess up is Everybody wants to be that one key component to an individual success, and that's not how success really works. Mm. If you look at it, success is nothing more than a jigsaw puzzle, and it takes all pieces to come together for you to really realize what that puzzle is supposed to look like. Sometimes when you're putting the puzzle together, you don't care about the corner pieces and things like that because you can still see the image. Right. But your life is a big puzzle that has images all the way across it so missing one of those vital pieces and too many times people try to live vicariously through others so it has to come through me or i have to be the key point point. and the truth of the matter is each one of those pieces of that puzzle are codependent on each other right and if you can find a way to understand that part which is why a lot of the relationships the beefs the the button heads back and forth between sometimes coaches and athlete and parent and athlete and even sometimes you come across bad people, and that's a part of it as well. But even those bad people are there to shape and mold you into the person that you're supposed to become. Mm. Our story started, obviously, long ago. I think I was eight, nine years old, yes. probably, when we right. started. And I was at Robinswood, mm. of all places, um, right. <laughs> talking about track and field. We didn't think about golf. Golf wasn't a thing. But the work ethic, the dedication that was instilled in me by my parents, mm -hmm. and then that was demanded on me by my coaches. I mean, how many times was it – you know, my mom didn't ever side with me when it came to the workouts. She never was like, oh, well, he just don't feel like it today. She didn't care. Oh, well, he didn't go to school today. Well, then he can't go to practice. You know, it was always those things that were really embodied by my parents in conjunction with my coaches. It was never a, well, you know, my son, you you ain't going to talk to my son that way. You're not right. going to do my son that right. way. She was like, when she he's under your care. You're supposed to follow the rules, and, and the rules are simple. And I tell you, so it's funny you say that because I never. I mean, one of our moments was we're at the track, and we grind. Right. We working out there. Yeah. And we running. I don't know. I don't know. We running them sprints or we running some figure eights. But I clearly remember you got you you, you, you cramping up. Oh yeah, I remember that cramping day. We running. Up. We running them hills yeah. by the back by the back. sixty star that Robbins was That's up right. the little dirt hill. And yeah. boy, you were cramping up, cramping up. And I'm like, all right, let's be cool. Let's take a break. And she walked out there. What? Take a break. Right. Yeah, she don't believe in breaks. There ain't no break. You better get up and get it done. It wasn't yeah. none of that. It, it took a lot for her to say, okay, I right, maybe need to take a break. It took a lot. I don't know if she ever even said that. But how did that make you feel knowing that, you know, the coach is saying, hey, let's ease up a little bit or whatever. But the mama said, no, he got it. I can do this. You know, what made her say that? Was it just she just knew that you had it in you or she knew the level that you can go? Or what was it? Because I know I'm a hard coach. I know when you had to run 4-400, 3-300, 2-200, 2-100, and might go back up the ladder, then come down here running, you know, and to be the best we can be, to, right, to start that journey to be a champion. But Mama had a different mindset a little bit there. Yeah, I mean, I think it all boils back. It's all spiritual. I don't care who you are. And if you understand the spiritual journey that you have in life, if you understand, like I, when you ask me, who am I? And I said I was the answer to the prayers that were beaten, raped, and murdered in the fields. You have to understand where that comes from. If you look back when our people were enslaved, those people knew that they were never, ever going to see a better day. They got up every morning. They went to bed every night mm -hmm. praying to God and working and hoping and instilling into their kids something that they knew they'd never see. And so when I get out there and I go perform, I understand that I'm not performing just for myself. Mm -hmm. I'm understanding that I'm performing for something greater. You know, my grandmother was a maid. My grandfather was a janitor when they first started. And so understanding the hard work of those individuals, understanding the hard work of my mother, understanding the hard work of my father, and seeing that every day, day in, day out, people getting up at 5 o'clock in the morning to mm -hmm. go to work, putting in the grind, making sure they're getting off of work to come and take you to practice and fighting traffic and paying these bills and doing all this other stuff. And you think you're going to come out here and you're not going to give you a fool? Right. No, that's not how that works. You know what's so interesting about what you said, right? Uh, getting off work, get up five in the morning, getting off work, picking you up, bringing you to practice. 
You know I never, ever had to pick you up to come to practice. No. I never had to pick you up. Mm-hmm. I never had to take you home. Never I never had, had, to, had to wait take late. You to attract me. I never had to wait late. None of that. I didn't have to do any of that. Mm-mm. Your mother, parent, they was right there every time. So that now, but then I'm always hearing these stories saying, I drove the kid home and there was two, four cars in the parking lot, uh, driveway. Oh, I, I came to pick him up to go to the game and everybody was still in the house. That's mm-hmm. what we're hearing still to this very day. Now this back in, when you was in middle school, here it is, grown man, successful, right? A champion and it's still going on today. Why is it like that? I mean, at the end of the day, being a parent is not easy. Uh, I got two kids myself. It's not easy. It's a sacrifice. But you also understand that you have to be an individual who practices what you preach. See, a lot of people say, do as I say, not as I do. And that doesn't work. You know, you go to class, you go to camps, you go to practice, you see all these parents on the sideline and they're jawing at their kids about what they need to do and the effort they need to give when my mom came to practice, she was either running, she was walking, she was working out. She was never just sitting there reading a book or just jaw jacking on the phone, FaceTime and playing the game. She was always active. So it was never a thing where even if I wanted to be that disrespectful kid who said, well, you ain't doing it. You know, I, I never had the ability to do that. I never saw that. I saw the discipline from the top to the bottom. Everybody right. in my family that I was close to, all the – Significant people who played a role in my life, all of them literally did exactly what they said they were going to do. So that was just instilled in me. And my parents knew they were parents first. Obviously, they had to work, but we did things solely around their work schedule, their availability, they communicated. So even if even though they weren't together, my step parents were really, really good as, as far as being there because they bought into a system as well. So it wasn't an issue where. It was somebody else's job. It wasn't somebody else's responsibility to take care of me. And I knew that. I knew that everybody has a job to do. Their jobs to go to work, pay the bills, put a roof over the head, food, mm-hmm. clothes, some of the things that I want, not all the things I want. And my job is to go perform, whether that be in the classroom or on the field. And right. every time I stepped up, it was time to get it done. Exactly. So now we leave Robin Woods, right? So we already have that instilled instilled in us that we work hard, they work hard, you do your part, I do my part. We're a team, mm-hmm. we're family. We're gonna work together because we got a plan. Now we we had we could have easily with that type of family there and that type of support, easily you could have went to a private school. You could have went to Lake Holland. You could have went to Bishop Moore. No, we couldn't. But I mean, if, I mean, at the same time, though, it's always was ways and avenues. Sometimes like, oh, we got a scholarship for it. We can go here and go there. But you went to Evans High School, right mm-hmm. at Evans High School, right there, a, a person with all that support and love that you had. Get to Evans High School. That journey is itself. How were you able to continue doing what you're doing? You, you did track, ran track at Evans. Ran track, played football, played volleyball, played soccer, played baseball. Five sports. Know. Yeah. Five sports in high school, five sports. But we all were telling everybody just play football or just maybe run track too, you know, because that's been a big deal now, track and football. Five sports, why five sports? I mean, for me, volleyball was my first love. That's the first first team I made in middle school. Secondly, track was probably my second love. Baseball was my third love. Football, I just wanted to get the girls, so that's where football <laughs> came from. We and, know you got that. We got too many kids then, right now. And then <laughs> from there, soccer was something just to keep you in shape. But I think the bigger thing was – by doing all those things, I stayed busy. And then I got to a point where I had to outgrow sports. So, like, I didn't play baseball after freshman year because I couldn't anymore because track and baseball were in the same, same season. Same season, yes. So, football worked a little bit different my senior year, but I was still able to do both of those sports at the same time. But I think the major thing was an idle mind is, is the devil's playground. I don't care who you are. A child, grown person, if you really don't have anything to do if you're not committed – and especially in the underdeveloped mind, all kinds of d- distractions can get in the way. So it was never a thing where I was concerned about getting into trouble, going out, doing any of that, because I had games, I had grades. 
In my mom's house, if you didn't have over a three five, you couldn't play. Forget the two old that they buy. Yeah, if you didn't have what a three five. What are you talking about? Three five? Three whoa, five. whoa, 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 whoa. Three point five GPA, you couldn't do nothing at three point five. Here I am telling kid two point five to order to be on a seven on seventeen. Two point five to play on my you pop one a foot my pop one a team. You had to have a two point five or you couldn't play in the game. And you talking about three point five back then, and, and you and you were able to play. Had it ever been a time where you didn't get that GPA and she really set you down? Closest time my GPA was low, I think, was seventh grade, and that's when I realized because she was like. You're on the cusp of not playing. And I think I was at a three, three, three. I was under. I was under the. It, I was under the established rules that were set. The, mm. the rules were set. You knew what the rules were at the beginning of the school year. You signed the contract. You had a discussion, contract negotiation. Mm. You had a plan. What are you going to go out for? What are you going to try to do? Okay, what classes are we going to take? So on and so forth. I mean, when I graduated from Evans. I honestly could have graduated my junior year, but they wouldn't let me take English four because I had more than enough credits. I went back my my senior year. I just took college classes. Everything wow. that they had that was dual enrollment that you could take, I took because there was nothing else left for me to do. I literally went back for one class. But it was one of those things where you set up a plan. Think about it. When I decided to come to this studio, I didn't know where it was. I knew I was coming here. I knew I was coming to talk to you. I knew all of that. Right. But before, as of... Yesterday, when you sent me the address, the first thing I did when I got the address was I put it in my maps. So then I know, number one, how long is it going to take me to get where I'm from to get here? Because yeah. I had to establish a plan for my day. Because I couldn't have you waiting on me. I couldn't have your, your guys who are here setting this thing up waiting on me. I couldn't have the people waiting on me. And so I understood the position that I was in at that particular moment. And the same thing happens with everything in life. If you sit down and make a plan – and you understand what you're up against, it makes life so much easier. The majority of the things that happen bad to us, honestly, are our fault because we didn't think things forward. We weren't forward thinking enough. We weren't being proactive. We were constantly being reactive. And in a reactive state, anything can happen. Right. So, so we're in high school, right? Yep. And we're being proactive. Yep. Right? Right. We're not being reactive. We're being proactive in every way. Right? But we got all these, these sports we're running. We're doing all these different sports. You start narrowing them down, narrowing them down. Right. Mm -hmm. But then at the same time, we knew that was important. What was important was student athlete. No. Mm. No. OK. Well, what was important? Greatness. Greatness. Nothing else. Greatness of being a student and an athlete. No. Just being greatness. Greatness. Everything you do, a great human being, a great athlete, a great student, a great son, all of that. Greatness. Greatness. You know, it's interesting, right? I walked into the studio and we were talking and I was doing one of my little quotes and he's and I got ready to close it out. I was going live. All right? He's I'm gonna close it out. And I had to close out with a different quote. And he said, You should have said the mindset of greatness, a commitment. No, I'm always saying that quote. Right. And everything I say, I always end it with the word greatness. You know, and it's interesting how you just tied it in. And once again, I think that still go back to the coach player relationship because we had that mindset. Of greatness. When we train, we got to be the greatest. We got to be the best. When we went to track meet, we got to be the greatest. We got to be the best. Mm -hmm. We always. But it seemed like everyone was trying to do that so they can get out. You know, get out of where they was at and get somewhere else. What were you trying to do? Was you just trying to get out or were you just trying to, what were you trying to do? Uh, you know, with all the things that you were doing, all the different sports, four point, oh, GPA, can't have less than 3.5. What, what, what were you trying to do? Because this is part of being a champion. I mean, I wasn't trying to get out. There was nothing wrong and still is nothing wrong with Pine Hills to me. I love my people. I love black people. I think as black people, we're conditioned to hate ourselves. We're always taught that you have to look a certain way. You have to talk a certain way. Everything that we culturally do is wrong. And the only way that you can make it out is to change yourself from what, what is around you rather than uplift the people that are next to you. Got it. And so for mm -hmm. me, it's it was never a thing of trying to get out. I was perfectly mm -hmm. happy with being in Pine Hills. I'm still happy every time I go to my mama's house. I tried to buy a house in Pine Hills, but I just couldn't find one that I liked. So I, I, I got close. You know, right. I got as close as I could. But I think the the bigger thing about it is understanding and having a true passion and love for my people, for my area, and seeing the possibilities and the talent and the true blessings and gifts that are 
literally locked into those people in that area. And sometimes you have a giant that's sleeping. And I think that's what our community is. It's literally a sleeping giant. And at some point we'll learn that we are a giant and we'll move. But until we decide to do that, it's going to be chaos like it is right now. Wow, I see that, man. And I totally agree about the chaos. And, and you see how things are going, the direction we're going, what our youth kids are going. And we try to come back and, and give it, give back to them. And, and that's why we come on the Listen to Low Show, where we can, people can hear it or where it come from and let them to give them a chance, right? And my, my, my biggest focus now is really is just leading to being that champion. So I'm in high school. I'm trying to lead up to it, right? Because it didn't just, you need to become a champion. You jump out the bed and I'll still hit the ball 400, well, hold on, I don't want to say the wrong word later, but <laughs> 486, I've seen on, on YouTube. There was a process to get there. We're, we're, we're in high school. Yeah. I'm thinking, you're going to get a track scholarship. I did get one. We, 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 we jumping out the pit. Yeah. We jumping out the pit. You gliding in the air yeah. like Michael Jordan going to dunk the ball from the free throw, top of the key. Won national championships, did all that national stuff. National champion. Yeah. I'm like, I'm saying to myself, ooh, I got me one. He, but this, this is it. Yep. Where did we go from high school? Where, where, I mean, where, where we, was that now? You know, went to University of South Florida. Coach left, ended up with a coach that I didn't like. Stopped playing, stopped running track, started playing football. Obviously, me and football don't work, but it's okay. That was your fifth love. It, it, it was, it that was, was your more. Fifth love. Now, don't try to break it back. I, but now. I'll say this: okay. football worked because <laughs> I love the lights. Right. Remember, I used to love running in the track meets where the lights was at on. at nighttime. And so, anytime I can get under the lights, it's a whole nother ball game. I don't know what it does, but it, it definitely puts you in a different zone. And so, football definitely gave me a greater opportunity for that. But you know, transfer to Florida and M. Florida and M. Run track. On the All-American team, turn pro, Olympic trials, we're still running, you know. And then I end up tearing my hamstring in two, three different spots, and it makes it difficult to do anything at right. that point. And then we start finding our way back to baseball. Oh, okay. how that here we go. Go back to go to spring training with the Brewers, and and it's all based off of speed. They they're seeing speed. Speed gives me the opportunity. Then I had some stints with arena football, went back to football. Uh, and all these different things take place, and it was it was wonderful. But my senior year at Florida a and after I left and ran track professionally and then came back, so now we're in 2010, pick up a golf club. Mm. You know, I graduate from FAM. Honestly, it was a month. I think it was literally four weeks before I graduated from Florida a and uh, where I double major. So I was a biology and chemistry double major with a minor in math. Mm. And from there I go and start playing golf and go off to chiropractic school and leave chiropractic school mm. and playing golf. Yeah. Well, let me, before we even get into the golf part of it, right, I need to go back <laughs> because for anyone that can get me in college and don't get hurt and trapped, Different coach chain. Wait, wait. Go play football. Yeah. I'm gonna go to another school. I'm gonna play. Wait, wait, wait. I'm gonna go back to baseball. I'm. Isn't it true that doing multiple sports when you're young is better than just doing one sport? Because it looked like that worked for you. Because when you got to college, you were able to try different sports. And we don't know what that could have could have led. You could have messed around goddamn baseball and, like I say, still in all the base and you're fast and that thing, no, you're in the major league. Or we could have been in football and got some kick return, back and ran back for a touchdown. There you go. Now you're in the Hall of Fame like Devin Hester. <laughs> right. right. Or, or we could have not got hurt in track or whatever and, and, and went to the Olympics and, and did great there. But by doing all those sports young, it allows you to do it as you got older. But they always now pegging kids do one sport, one sport. Before we get into the golf, I want to educate people on that and your thoughts on that. I think what you end up with are repetitive injuries when you only stick with one sport. You change the sports IQ of a kid. You actually dummy them down. When you're playing different sports, you start to see parallels. You start to get them to think outside the box. You also get them in a different group of training mm. because now, you know, 
back then you had your friends that were different seasons. You had your baseball friends, <laughs> you had your football friends, mm -hmm. you had your track friends or your family as you call them. And you always had a dog in each one of those groups that you always worked hard mm -hmm. to either beat or to keep them off you and, and whatever. You all always played back and forth with each other to bring the best out of each other. Well, what happens when you go in the same sport over and over and over again? Number one, you're not training your muscles in a different manner. They're still, they're still moving in the same way. Well, your mind's not expanding. I mean, you can get definitely elite coaching, and I'm not saying that that doesn't have its place, but right. when you're young, lifting weights really isn't a thing, which you weren't into that for the longest with us. No. And so everybody's trying to throw you in the weight room, and that wasn't your thing. It was all about being an athlete. Well, the only way you really become an athlete is to play other sports. Playing the same thing over and over again doesn't make you an athlete. Mm -hmm. And so I've, I've never subscribed to telling a kid, you play baseball all year long. You play football all year long. No, I mean, if you took a football guy, had him play football during the season, and then during the winter they're playing soccer, then they're turning around and potentially running track or playing baseball – You've got them working all different types of things. And even if you're, for instance, if you're a receiver, look at Ocho. Ocho's probably the best example. His footwork really comes from soccer. His footwork doesn't come from football. Mm, right. Because he was an actual footballer, not a footballer. Baller, yeah. So <laughs> it's, it's, it's different. And so you Two can, different things. Right. You can, you can change a person's creativity. That's the thing that makes every great athlete great. That's what makes a champion a champion. It's not that – they are that much better. It's just they learn and they know how to win. And you find ways to win in other sports than being just stumped in your one particular sport. Okay. Well, I, I like that too. But I want to kind of be devil advocate on this one right here. Okay. Okay. Let's go be devil advocate. I played football. It only cost me $25 back in the day to play part one of football. Mm -hmm. I went to basketball. No problem. You know, it went all that AAU stuff like that. I paid twenty five dollars to do that. But back in my days, as we got more into your days and my son Lodem days, things kind of changed. Mm -hmm. Now, pay basketball AAU traveling costs a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Baseball, woo, a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Volleyball, trust me, I know, a lot, lot of, of money. money. So, but I know there's local ways to do it too. But when you're an athlete. What happened is I'm dominating football. I go to baseball, play a little bit of inner baseball at YMCA, right? All of a sudden, I don't hit the ball. It's knocked across the gate. Burn the curve. Burn, baby, burn. Boom. Everybody like, oh, wow, wow. He need to play AAU. Then I'm at a basketball, playing local basketball. I'm dropping three like they're hot. Oh, he need to go to AAU. So now they're pulling me. They're pulling me. And I can't do it. I can't, parent can't pay for it. Mm -hmm. Parent can't afford it. Now I'm back to football. Got football now, $300 for the whole year. Go to the game, sit down, go back home. Mm -hmm. How do, you were able to do it. I mean, my, my financial situation was different, and I understand that. So what I would tell people is this. Number one, in your particular area, every, everybody's always searching for this competitive edge they're, they're going everywhere and playing and going everywhere and playing <laughs> in today's world with social media you ain't got to go nowhere mm -hmm. do what you do where you're at and they're gonna come to you mm -hmm. uh that's that's honest do you have to play against the top players obviously that's great because mm -hmm. you get to see yourself in competition and i i agree with that but the crazier thing to me is all the money that these parents spend for these kids to go play, travel this, travel that, travel this, travel that. And then my question to them is, well, why are you doing it? Oh, I want them to get a scholarship. Well, over the course of eight years, you already spent the money for college already. Whoa, 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 whoa. Boy, you give me – I didn't got a flashback just then because that's so enough true. Yeah, I mean, you, you spent $30,000, $40,000, $60,000, $80,000 over the course of – eight years so you already paid for college now if you're doing it for the enrichment of your child the exposure the experience for them to travel for them to see what's possible mm -hmm. for you all to bond for you all to make memories i will never ever argue a parent for doing priceless. that, That's that priceless. part that part is a whole nother ball game i remember going to aau nationals with my mom and it was always fun to give her the medal and you know, when I win in the long jump, I'd always take some of the sand because I saw Carl Lewis do it, yeah, and I had yeah. bags of sand from all the all places I won yeah. and, and all the other stuff, and it was kind of cool, and then we'd all go eat and all that stuff. That, that, that part was priceless. It wasn't about going to this meet so I could get a scholarship. 
because I knew I was going to get a scholarship. I wasn't worried about a scholarship. Academically, I was impeccable. Athletically, I was one of the best in the nation. So it was only a matter of time when people were going to come find me. It was just a matter of who. Mm-hmm. And was it the place that I wanted to go and the place that I felt that was great for me? But if you focus on the wrong things, a lot of times we're focusing on the finance and we're not focusing on the life that's in front of us. And the life that's in front of you is everything. The time that you have with your kids and growing and and nurturing your kids and getting them ready for whatever is next in life because you don't know when you're going to leave here and when you don't. So everything's not transactional. Right. And I know I definitely agree with that. I was talking to um, one of the parents. And I said, man, you no know, volleyball is tough. It's a lot of money, a lot of travel, a lot of, a lot of time. I said, I spent this X amount of money. I could already pay for college. I said, I don't advise nobody to play volleyball. Though I'm telling him, I'm not like this is just too much. It's out of control. Somebody, said, my son, my daughter won't play volleyball. Mm-mm, go run track. Uh, I'm trying to steer him away from you know that ain't the sport for us. You know that was tough. You know, and he looked at me and he said, "Lo, your daughter played volleyball." for 10 to 12 years Mm -hmm. before she went to college. She got a full scholarship. When you agree to 10 to 12 best years of you and her life together, and I looked at him, I was like, yeah, you're right. I mean, but it it took some one-on-one to kind of like, to tell me that, because like you said, it went about the money. You know, I'm I'm thinking, spending this money, and I could afford it. If you can't afford it, you wouldn't do it anyway. But still, I'm thinking that way. But it's it's no cost on time Mm-mm. with your with your kids. It's nope. no cost on time. I no mean, cost that, on time with the people that you love in general. Not even just your period. kids, just anybody. And so if you're if you're looking at the return on investment or whatever the case may be, everybody's in this world is is really harping on money. Mm-hmm. And honestly, money is the most irrelevant thing out there. It's kind of like on the golf course, guys want to bet all the time. They go, oh, man, I bet you 100 bucks. I bet you – I was like, I don't want none of that. I bet you 50 push-ups. I bet you 100 push-ups. Oh, man, I ain't doing that. Why you want to bet me that? Well, because I know you can go make more money. Hmm. I ain't worried about that. I want a little piece of your soul out here. I want to see you go – I want to hear that. <laughs> that's what I want to hear. I want to own a little bit of your soul in my back pocket. <laughs> right, and that's right. what I'm looking for. Because money, money can be – Gotten money can be lost, money can be stolen, it can be gained, it can be earned, all kinds of stuff right. with money. But at the end of the day, it don't matter right. because you're always going to be paying for something. Right. When have I, you ever seen a person that don't pay for nothing? I'll wait. I was talking about, uh, you know, to say uh, it's free. Ain't nothing free. Nope. And I like what you said too. I go back to a return on investment. I hear it all the time in volleyball. Return on investment is starting to trickle down to football. It used mm-hmm. to be where you play football, you do your thing, you go to high school, right? But now since football, to my opinion, I'm turning to what we call money ball. But everybody want to return their investment. So mm-hmm. I'm spending all this money for my, my kids to travel all over to play, not six-year-old, eight-year-old to travel to, to Detroit, Indiana, Atlanta, Indianapolis, Atlanta to play a youth football game, right? At six, seven, eight years old. They're they doing it now. They're going to that route. And they're like, I got to do it. I, ha- I mean, I have to do it. I got to get a return on my investment. I got to work and we got to train. You got to get out there no matter what. And then they let the grades start to slacking. And they're like, oh, forget that part. Them football, 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 sport, sport, sport. Because they got to get a return on your investment. And I, I right, think we so missed that boat. We're going to stop that. Go ahead. Okay, Go ahead. So Go first ahead. things first. Highest paid person in the NBA right now is who? NBA? Mm-hmm. Jalen Brown. Okay. How much money does Jalen Brown make, give or take? 300 some million. Okay. What team does Jalen Brown play for? Boston. Okay. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. Who write Jalen Brown checks? The NBA write the check. No. But the people who pay to get him tickets no. in the game? The sponsors? No. no. Pepsi? Somebody no. got a soda machine there to pay all the money? No. It's te- television? The owner. The owner. So, so let me ask you this question now, because he's a employee of the Boston Celtics. The owner is responsible for everybody on that payroll, every player, every medical staff, every coach, and you can go down the list of them, even to the people who change the floor out. Do you think that this man is writing this person a bigger check than he gets every year? No. So then... Sports is not the way out, but education is. Yes. Jeff Bezos has more money than most people because of Amazon. 
And the thing that people are not understanding why you out here chasing this sports career, I always tell every kid, do not go be an athlete. It is harder work than having a desk job. If you don't love it, mm. if you don't love it, if you can't wake up every morning and go to sleep every night, and if you have not been on your field or if you have not been training, if you have not lifted weight and you don't feel complete unless you've done that, then you probably should go be an athlete. But if you're just trying to chase money, you want to buy your mama a house, you want to buy a Lambo, you want to do all this other stuff, go pay attention in that classroom. Mm. I promise you, you got a better chance of getting all that stuff. I'll give you the real numbers. I'm going to start with a simple one. Go ahead. Okay. How many people play in the NFL? Love this number. Ooh, what? Four to six player per team plus. So you got a 53-man roster on each team. What, four to six now? 46. Okay. How many teams? What is now? 20, 27, 28? 32 teams. 32 teams. All right. 32 teams. So that's what? 500 and some odd people. 530. Well, you know, I'm good at math, but you don't want to call it for a minor in math. Yeah. me. <laughs> <laughs> Two thousand people. So two thousand. So we got two thousand people. All right, watch this. Now I take these two thousand people. You gonna tell everybody that they they have a chance to get into the NFL? No. Okay. No, 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 no. Let's. <laughs> let, We're go. gonna tell them that. Yeah. Okay. So dream. let's let's, let's go off that. Now. So now let's yeah. break it down. Okay. If I'm six six, two hundred and seventy pounds, well, I can guarantee you it's probably about. I don't know, 10 positions that I can't play. <laughs> Minimum. More like 15. There's really only eight positions I can play on each team. Multiply that by 32. Mm. If I'm 5'5", five, 5'8", five, five, 170 pounds, really ain't but four positions I can play on either side of the ball. Right. Combined right. for 32 teams. Right. Okay? So now these numbers get real small. Because mm -hmm. based on your body type, and when you really look at it, there's only four positions. So four positions at 32 teams is how much? It's a very simple one. Four times 30. 120. 20. Okay. So for each person's body type, and you do have a freak athlete that may that may get eight. So we'll 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 yeah, bump freak. it up to yeah, yeah, the, the, freak, the freaks, some, the freaks, the freaks that's out freak. there that can get eight positions. Yeah, yeah. So now you at two forty. Two forty. Mm -hmm. Average lifespan of an NFL player is three years. That's it. Okay, cool. Now watch this. This is where it's gonna throw you off. You ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Okay. How many companies in the Fortune five hundred? Five hundred. All them companies have a what at the top? Uh, CEO. So mathematically, it's two times easier for you to be a CEO of a Fortune 500 company than it is to play in the NFL. <laughs> NFL's a dream. A college degree is reality. <laughs> but here's my thing. How many CEOs keep their job for more than two to three years? Mm. Now, see, here we go again. Here we go again. <laughs> if we're looking at the numbers. So that's why. So we got all these kids out here basing themselves to be at an elite level where there's only 240 mm. positions possible for them. Ain't nobody waking up saying, I'm going to be a CEO of a Fortune 500 company. Now, mind you, outside the Fortune 500, these CEOs are making very good money. Very good money. But no one's having that thought process because we think that this is the only way out. The only reason why I sit in front of you the way I do now is because my brain power was better. Yeah. You know, my brother was a much better athlete than me. Jamar, we mm -hmm. thought he was the one right. till he broke his ankle. We thought he was the one. We knew it. We knew he was better. I know he was better. I don't, add, I don't doubt it. Yeah. I don't lie about it. Jamar was a much better athlete than me, hands down, all the way. My brother was so much better. Right. He got hurt, I didn't. What we seeing in front of me, my whole life that we see, that wasn't mine, that was his. That's what we all thought. We thought I was going to be good. Right. We thought I had a chance, right. but he was the superstar. I remember when we brought shot that. I, yeah. He was there. I also said, this is his little brother. Yeah. <laughs> he the one. Jamar is the one, not me. Yeah. Not but me at all. You know, I want to go back to something that you said that's very interesting too, right? And you, you, you brought it up. And... 
we talk about the education side of it because about the Fortune 500 the CEO. The way football is going now and recruiting going or sports periods, that might be the way that they're going to be the answer now, because now it's all geared towards certain athletes now. The money side of it, and the athlete that would have went to D one or big time program, now they are now going to smaller program. Two years ago, I had seven boys that I just knew they're going to go at least to FAU or go to uh, Virginia, who's not doing that good, but they're a great academic school. Mm -hmm. Didn't go in there. But two of them went to Yale. I got two Princetons. Mm -hmm. We had uh, Valparaiso. You might think it's a great educator, a great right. academic school. We had, uh, so these guys went to Cornell. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, Holy Cross, yep. West Point, Navy, so they mm -hmm. go to them schools there. They play football, but at the same time, they understand the high a higher level education. education. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's, I'm telling you, I feel like that's the way it goes. So that part about student athlete I brought up earlier, it's, it's, I know it went by greatness, but student athlete mm -hmm. is losing to athlete student. It's losing because, because that's what they want to do. And we, you, you brought that up. But they need to keep that in place and what gonna make it be in place is because of the money and what they're doing in sports now with the NIL and all that. So the kids will have to be smarter, man. NIL. All right, here we go. So everybody looks at the million dollars and thinks it's a lot of money. Let's do the real. <laughs> million dollars after you take the taxes at thirty three leaves you what? Six hundred. Right. Six hundred or thirty eight. Thirty eight. Well let's let's just I know, round it up. I, well actually it depends on what state you're in. Correct. Because depending you, on your state and then what school depends on how much they take, too, because they can take as much as half. Correct. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So let's just say we're at the school where they're going to take half. All right, cool. You got half. Gone. Now you're at five. That's what's up. $100,000 a year ain't no money. Nowadays, we know that. <laughs> you burn through that. 100 real quick. Mm -hmm. we so know what, that. Are, what are we really talking about? You're not talking about life-saving, life-changing, life-altering money. I mean, that's all thing. I think it was yesterday or the day. Kurt, Coven, Kurt Cousins will have more career earnings money through contract than Tom Brady. Wow. And he didn't if win he, seven he, Super Bowls. He, so he ain't won, won but one playoff game. One Forget, playoff game. You ain't talking about Super Bowls. I mean, he ain't won but one playoff game his whole career. You have wow. to understand. But here's the kicker. Some people's purpose. God's vision for some people is unexplainable. So stop judging yourself based on what you see everybody else getting and being upset at what you not get. getting. When you get the opportunity, do with it what you're supposed to do. Do what you're led to do. Remember what you're there for and your purpose, and then everything else will be okay. Now, you don't know me how many years. I don't never talk about money to nobody. Nobody. I don't never ask for no money. I don't talk about money. I give a lot to my community because that's what I'm supposed to do. That's what God has ordained for me to do. I've probably given away over half a million dollars worth of stuff in a sport where you don't make that money. There, there are no million-dollar contracts in my sport, right. but that's not it. I also never worry about anything because of the way how I am obedient to God's plan. Right. So a lot of times we find ourselves looking at NIL. We think that NIL is going to be the Savior. Truth be told to you, and this it, it sounds terrible, but let's be honest, money does not fix problems. For some reason, as black people, we think that money fixes problems. Might be oh, paying your problems. It, well, I mean, <laughs> best example I can ever give anybody is if money fixed problems, or Anthony Bourdain still be alive right here, right now. Hmm. That's as real as it get. He had the easiest job in the world, or so we thought. Travel the world, eating food. Yep. On, on video. Yep. Put out a show. Eating yep. food, kicking it. Shooting it with the people. Hey, what's up? Yeah. Chilling. Yeah. Dead as a doorknob, though. Seriously. Yeah. He died by himself. Money solves absolutely nothing. Finding your purpose and following God's ordained light in your life is everything. So speaking of purpose, you know, everyone have a purpose. You know your purpose. I mean, I know my purpose. And now life. you know your purpose because yeah. you was mad when you got hurt. Well, yeah. You thought you were supposed to be there, but yeah. you have changed more lives than and helped more I, people than you ever would have helped agree. if you made it. I agree. There we go. I agree. Okay. Because 
I remember in high school, I remember they asked me, what you want to be when you grow up? I said, a businessman and a coach. Mm-hmm. But instead, I'm still trying to go football, playing football, playing football. I get hurt. Come home, businessman, coach. Mm-hmm. Know your purpose. You know your purpose. I know my purpose. But sometimes things have to happen for you to find that purpose sometimes. Or you have to go through different journeys or different things. I want to get back now to Maurice Allen, the three-time world champion. Okay. Not football, no. not basketball, Definitely not, not track. Wish I'll, that could have happened. All right, yeah. But yeah, you <laughs> wish that could have happened. I wish it could have happened too. And they were like, Lo Wood, train him, baby. Right? So how, how did you say you – after all the journey through college, all of a sudden, here come, here come opportunity. You picked up a golf club. You just picked it up. Mm-hmm. What make you pick up a golf club? I mean, that I mean, was nowhere in no one category. I mean, no one. It was in no about. one's category but my dad's. My dad tried to get me to play golf from the time I was two, three years old. And he always had clubs at the house. That's the only sport I ever seen the man play. And. I used to go to the golf course with him, but that wasn't serious. I didn't play. I didn't play in tournaments. I didn't do any of that stuff. And it was a way for us to bond. And by the time I ended up going to Florida A&M senior year, somebody bet me I wasn't athletic enough to hit a golf ball. I was like, man, I ain't hit the golf ball, bro. And so we went to this thing, simulator inside, hit the ball, and he was looking at me crazy. And I was like, what? He's like, man, you need to go try this thing out. And I was like, ah, don't worry about it. Went out. My cousins were on the golf course, and I told them about it, and they were like, man, this golf course is down the street. Let's go try it. So I ended up going to this competition for long drive. I was 50 yards past everybody, and but the ball wasn't in bounds. <laughs> and it was crazy because that's the first time I truly saw what greatness will do for you because there was this lady who was there, and it was, it was a country hick town. And big southern draw, she was like, baby, I just want to see you hit that ball again. I'll pay you entry. <laughs> I'll pay for you to hit. I'll pay for you pay to do for it. You again. Hit. Uh-oh. Yeah. Uh-oh. And so she paid the 40 bucks. I was like, all right, thank you, ma'am. I appreciate it. And I still kept the ball out of bounds. And she looked back at me. She said, I don't know who you are, but you're something special. Mm. And so, but it's all about from that moment on, going to chiropractic school. I was working on my doctorate. When you really look at life, if you take yourself out of it, And this is where a lot of people go wrong because from the time you were a child, you've always been trying to get what you want. Mm -hmm. Think about it. You got a little baby. What the baby do? Scream, holler. Mm -hmm. And they've been conditioned. The more I scream and the more I holler, the easier it is for me to get what I want. Well, that same thing happens to you later on in life. So you get upset. You get pissed off. All these things happen. You mad. You stomping your feet. And until you get what you want. Or you learn to lie and manipulate to get what you want. Okay? Mm -hmm. But – very rarely do you actually look at what's happening and why it's happening and understand that that is a part of the process. So my process didn't start when I actually got to chiropractic school. My process started two semesters before in the fall. Right. It was a girl I was talking to, and we had a guest speaker. You know, senior year guest speaker, <laughs> I ain't going to class. <laughs> so we sitting outside on the set at FAMU. And my cousins was like, hey, man, you know we got guest speaker? I was like, oh, y'all know we not going. We going over the state to hang out. The girl I was talking to was like, well, I put my books in there. I was like, that's your problem, not my problem. Right. We had just started talking, so yeah. you wasn't even my lady at that point. So <laughs> you on your own. Right. True slime. I know. I can't help it. Come but on, man. Come on, man. <laughs> I'm honest about myself, <laughs> right. though. You know, ain't no use in lying about it. And she actually convinced me to go into the class. So I did the gentleman thing. I didn't leave her, so I went and I sat there. I was not. I was very reluctant about it. Understand that I wasn't happy about being in there. Yeah. I was mad, and we sat in there, and there was this guy named Michael Harris gave a presentation on this chiropractic school called Life College, it's Life University. So we going through that, and he's asking questions, and I'm answering them because I had the personal training business and all this other stuff. And he came to me after the presentation, and said, "Mr. Allen, can you please? I waive the application fee and everything. Just fill out this application for me." My grandmother always said, you never miss an opportunity because you don't know what it is. Correct. So I filled out the app. They came back. They gave me a work-study job, all this other stuff. I went up there to check out the school. And when I checked out the school, I had just started picking up long drive. 
And I met this guy, J.R. Ross, who was, I don't know, two miles down the street from the school, talking to him. I said, hey, man, I'll be back up here. I'm moving on this day. I want to set up an appointment with you at this time. Now, this is 90 days out. Like most coaches, you hear people say that all the time. Yeah, 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 right, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I ain't show back up. And you brush it you know, off. I, I, I still hear that right now, the very day training. Yeah, we're going to be out there, coach. We're going to be out there, coach. Still waiting on them to come out there. Right. And so, <laughs> JR, I'll tell you, it was to the minute. I called him. I said, hey, man, I'm five minutes out. He was like, I thought you was full of it. Mm. I didn't really think you were going to show up for that appointment. So, he and I started grinding, and I ended up meeting the athletic director playing rec league softball at the school. Guy named Coach Barrett. He was like, Well, I was on the softball team. We started rapping, started talking. He heard he liked golf. He was into golf. He said, Well, what do you think about you being the student athlete for the school in golf? I said, We ain't got no golf team. He said, We NIA. We can do whatever we want to do. Mm. So you NIA, what is that? I don't know what that is. Because I'm used to Division One, Two, and Three. You only hear this on Listen to Low. That's it. I didn't even know what the NAIA school was. I'm dead serious. He was like, man, we make the rules. We do whatever. Because the regulations were so loose yeah, compared right. to NCAA, mm-hmm. right? And so what they started doing, brother, when I tell you, they sent me all around to these long drive competitions on the school dime. Long drive in college. Man, I was a one-man team. You Never. hear what I'm saying? I ain't, I'm, I'm dead serious. I ain't no joke. And what ended up happening was there was this driving range on the opposite end. So JR's driving range was this way. There was another driving range that way. And what ended up happening was the driving range on the north side of the school, for $100 a year, you can go to the range and hit unlimited golf balls all day long. So someone stopped going to class. I didn't know that you had to physically go to grad school classes. I mm. thought it was like undergrad. You show up when you show up. When time to take a test, you do your thing, you keep it moving. I ended up getting kicked out of school. This ain't no joke. I got kicked out of school, lack of attendance. I didn't know because I was at the driving range hitting 1,500, 1,000, 2,000 balls every day. Somewhere yeah. between 1,000 and 2,000 balls every day hitting balls. Trying to get better because I was obsessed. Right. Remember, obsessed is a key word. And, and so... I get called to the president's office. President, say, hey, Maurice, I got to kick you out of school. <laughs> oh, oh, here you go. You got to do what, man? He said, yeah, man, our accreditation, we can't have no flaws. We was just got off suspension. You got to go, brother. Mm. And at that point, reality hit me because I'm sitting there like, how am I tell Sarah this? <laughs> that's, the, that's the first thing that pop up. <laughs> and he was like, hey, and he kicked me out early in the morning. It was like 9 a.m. He was like, but I need you to come back at 3 and I need you to come with your full long drive schedule. I'm looking at him like, man, I'll come back here. I'm going to burn this place up. What you mean? <laughs> come back here with my long drive schedule. So right. I came back at 3 o'clock. Dr. Reekman wasn't even in the office. Because I'm walking by, and I see his car ain't there. So I'm pepper hot. You done kicked me out of school. Now, you, when you kick me out of school, I can't live in the dorm no more. My work-study job gone. I'm homeless. This ain't no job. I'm, I'm very serious about this. I'm homeless, brother. And then I'm walking by, and we got a meeting at 3 o'clock, and you got the audacity of not having your car here? So I'm a little early. I'm like, all right, maybe he's showing up. I walk in, and there's Secretary Danielle there. She says, uh, hey, how you doing? You're Maurice, right? I said, yes, ma'am. I'm here for Dr. Reedman. Oh, he's not coming. What? <laughs> oh, well, did you bring the paperwork, he asked? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, come in here with me. So we go from her little office in the front to his big office. And we sitting in there just like you and I sitting. She go to the computer, pull out the little keyboard, go into a drawer, pull out this man's black card. She purchased every flight, every hotel, pay for every entry, pay for every rental car that I had on that list wow. of my events for the rest of the year. Wow. I went to Sweden twice. Wow. I went to Spain. Wow. I went to Cali. Wow. I went to Mexico. Wow. Competing. Wow. And then, <laughs> I'm dead serious. This is, I'm dead serious. Brother, I promise to God on this. Hey, listen, trust me. And then, what tripped me out was he gave me a note. She said, and he left this for you. The note said, I know that you did not expect me to kick you out of school, but this is the only way I could keep my school the way it was. But I figured this is something I could do to help you along the way because I heard how good you are. And they paid for everything for the rest of the year. Never know who's watching. You never know who's watching. Now, here's the crazy thing. Now, this is the part that get people that they don't understand. 
So because, now we talked about setting a plan, like I used to do with my mom, right, and my dad at the beginning of every year. We set a plan. The plan was, Maurice, you're going to go to school, you're going to be here for four years, you're going to get your doctorate, and then you're going to move on. Right. There was no sports plan in that. Well, I deviated from the plan because I stopped going to class. Okay? So when I got kicked out of my dorm, I slept in my car for three months. I slept in Walmart parking lots. I slept in the parking garage at the school. Because these are places I felt safe. I threw my stuff wherever I could at people's place. A little bit of stuff in storage for what I could afford. And that was it. And I went from golf course to golf scramble, showering at golf courses, taking the lunches from the scramble, throwing them in my car because I didn't have no food, Mm. walking to practice when I was low on gas because I knew I didn't have any money coming in. My mom didn't know for four years that I was sleeping in my car. My stepdad kind of knew because he asked me about my registration. He said, hey, you got some mail at the house. Well, we got to send you registration because you got to send your registration. I said, oh, yeah, send it send it here. Why am I sending it to your cousin's house? <laughs> hey, man, yeah, yeah, that's just easier for me to right. get to it. What you doing? I- I'll tell y'all later. Serious. And that was a bigger part. And most people be really upset about that. Mm-hmm. But for me, I think that moment and understanding that I made an agreement with my parents. And did I have to be homeless? No. no. I could have came right back it was a here. Choice. It was a choice. But the truth is, because I decided to go against the plan, it was for me to suffer the consequences, not for somebody to bail me out. Mm. And if I don't go through that, do I think I have the community impact? Do I think I have the impact on the sport? Do I think I have the people impact that I have today? Absolutely not. Right. So once again, I go back to it. Every champion have the story mm-hmm. and I, and it starts not when you jump out of the bed, it started from young all the way through. Mm-hmm. I feel like that, so that impact, everything that just kept going, that drive, that drive back to doing five sports, that drive to, do, to go from one school to another school, nothing stop you, kept going, kept going. And also in back of your head saying, I can't disappoint mama. I can't disappoint my parent. I can't disappoint. I got to keep on driving, keep, keep on driving, keep on going. If I got to keep it a secret, if I got to might tell a couple of lies, I'm okay, I'm okay, and really I'm not. But you knew that you still were going to be the greatest. Yeah, I mean, my little brother and I always used to say one thing. You know, everybody says, go be great. And that was never our thing. You know, we used to always tell each other, go be immortal. Go be immortal. Go be immortal. Be immortal. Immortality is the whole goal. Nothing right. else matters. So you, so you go be immortal. Now... We had a whole new journey, in a sense. Yeah. A whole new, st- right? We, we were going this way, and we, we didn't know which way we were going. Now someone gave us a new journey, new opportunity, and I lose touch. I don't know where you're at. Right. No, no, Ellis and all us and Aaron Jones. Remember Coach Aaron yep. Jones? Yep. We're like, where is where Maurice Allen at? And, I, and I'm, I'm jumping, I'm fast forward a little bit, right? Because mm-hmm. all of a sudden... At I'm four seasons. I'm at four seasons <laughs> at a a fundraiser. Went out a big fundraiser. Yep. At four seasons, I'm walking through. I got my friend Josh Allen from Pylon. He invites me out, and I come out there. Don't know nothing about golf. I tried it one time, and I and just says I'm out of birdie. I'm looking for birds. I hit the ball, hurt my knee. A ball went over to somebody's the house. I said, "This is terrible sport. Who yep. would do this?" Yep. Get me out of here. But what I did like was the food cart that came around. <laughs> and I made sure I ate every time they came out. Hey, 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 hey. Give me that burger. Give me that sandwich. So the best thing for me for golf was the food cart, baby. It was so good. And the girl that would drive was beautiful. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. They, they know how to get you. They know how to make you spend that money. Right. But I get out there. I'm sitting down. I'm in VIP section, too. I feel like, oh, man, I see all these people with suits and ties. Everything's going good. Mm-hmm. And everybody walking a different step. LBGA event. LBGA. Tournament of Champions. I'm, I'm there. I'm there. Yeah. And they hitting the ball. I'm going. I'm like, okay, yeah, it's good. Everybody clapping. And I, it was it was a lot of big-time guys there. Mm-hmm. I'm leaving out, and I'm walking. And I look. I'm like, Maurice? Yep. And I'm just in awe. Shocked. Now, here I'm seeing, I like, so I'm going to say it like this now, little black boy from Pine Hills. 100%. Grown man out there 
stand up in golf gear on, playing golf. I don't know you were teaching somebody or what was going on. Oh, with- yeah, we was, we were just finished our round, and I was helping. Actually, I was helping Ray Allen. Ray Allen. Yeah. Yeah, I see. Now, I'm like, Ray. doing some golf. And I said, wow. Now, you looked at me, and what was – I'm now back to the coach-player relationship. I'm like, hey, what's up? Hit me up or something. And you're like, what? You run run over there, and I'm trying to give you a dab. Like, what? Yep. Give me a hug, right? Phone number, everything. We reconnect, and I learn the story and the journey. I get home, start following on social media. All of a sudden, the Rick Flair video come on. Oh, man. This you don't won – the long drive competition, two time, three time world, two this your second time world champion. You are right there. You just won it. They you you, you know this little black boy from a park. I mean from Pine Hill. I'm gonna say it again now. Right, I'm a little black boy from a park. You know you from Pine Hill, right? I had a business at Pine Hill. We tied all together. I'm right there. I'm watching, and you win it. Yeah, the microphone in your face. You did something that no one could have ever done around here. <laughs> no one even thought about doing. A whole different sport, a whole different journey, a whole different purpose in life. You get there, you win it, and they step in there, put it in your face. And you didn't say, <laughs> I'm going to Disney World. You said the Ric Flair. Yeah, it happens. Anthem. Yeah, it happens. <laughs> and it goes viral. 100%. Still 100%. Going. Still buyer. Yeah. More views than Ric Flair himself. Yeah. I don't know about that, but I'm just saying. I don't know about that. <laughs> it's close, though. It, it was it's, close. It, yeah. I mean, it's one of those things, man. You know, with us, it's funny because people ask me all the time about that, and they thought that I had it planned, and I didn't. I mean, you've been around me long enough to know that Whatever comes to the top of my head going to come off. You're going to come off quick. Man. <laughs> it's, like that. it's witty. Sometimes it goes. And, I mean, I know they always had an interview. And I remember after winning that that particular round, going into the next round, the guy who I was going up against was tough, really good competitor. But I had to hype myself up. I had mm-hmm. to do something. And I just told the guy who was interviewing me, I was like, man, just ask me how it feels. Yeah. And, I mean, they, he told me they were going off in his little IFB in his ear and people were running out with cameras was, trying yes. to get it because they were like, man, we don't know what this dude going to do, but <laughs> yeah. we know it's going to be gold. Right. <laughs> and, I mean, it was it was cool. You know, I think that goes and shows people the the power of black culture, honestly, because – A lot of white folks have done it. You know, you saw the Indianapolis Colts, they did it, and it was a part of their breakdown. Obviously, we've always done it as a part of the breakdown from back before XL even came. It was just just five of us out there training. That was one of the things. But it it shows how we make things cool, how we change things. And I think if I had been a white dude who did that in golf, it wouldn't have have caught viral like that. But – being me being me, only black dude on the tour at that time and winning and being the first major champion that the tour had ever had, I think it was just one of those things that set the bar and it set the standard. And, I mean, it went to a whole nother level. I think that thing ended up with almost 40 million views, 50 right. million views, right. something just right. absolutely sick. But the most important thing to me about that day is it was my dad's birthday. You know, I had the opportunity of living pretty much a dream. You know, I won back-to-back years on my dad and on my mom's birthday. And a lot of people can't say that they have, they know that their parents are proud. You know, everybody speculates or, you know, sometimes you think about the, the grinding and the work that your parents do for you to have the opportunities that you have. And you can never, ever pay them back. And for me, that was as close as I think I could ever do to pay them back was to win on their birthday separately. And that, that for me, honestly is the one, the two, two of the biggest, they're, they're definitely in my top five moments in my career. hundred percent. Right. Well, listen guys, you heard it there. You heard it best right here. You're episode four. You are listening to low sweet fried production present. Listen to low show. And we had on the three time world champion, Long drive competitor in golf, 
little black boy from a Pine Hill, Maurice Allen, gave you all the information you can get, all the knowledge you can get, all the nuggets you can get, all the motivation you can get, not just to you as a parent, but as a person, as a father, as a husband, as a wife, as a mother, as a friend, as a teacher or anything, you can take this with you and understand that your purpose in life is possible. Your journey is not over. Your journey can go far as you want it to go as long as you listen to Low. And you heard on the Listen Low show. And once again, I'm Low Wood, a.k.a. the Camp King. You listen to me right now on episode four, episode five, going to be even better than this. I'm telling you, every week, we want you to subscribe and like at Camp King with a K, K for kids, on YouTube. Follow us, listen to us. Two ears, one mouth. Remember, tough road often leads to worthwhile destination. And that's what I mean by every champion have a story. You heard a great one today.